our next guest, of course, uh, uh, joins us regularly to talk about uh, international affairs, uh, Professor Robert Patman. But I, I just cannot begin today's session with Robert um, without mentioning that he has, in the past week, I think, won the Critic and Conscience of Society Award, which is handed out by a thing called the Gamma Foundation. Um, and he gets a 50 grand funding grant, which is nice work if you can get it. And it is for education in the public and people about what is going on uh, in the world, in the world around us. So firstly, I want to start and welcome uh, Robert Patman uh, on the show and just say, well done, uh, Robert. That's a very nice Thank recognition. You. Thank you very much. Did you have, did you have like tea and cookies? Did they throw a party for you? <laughs> Oh, it was a very nice presentation. It was informal and uh, it was held in Christchurch. And um, I should explain, the Gamma Foundation makes available a fund uh, that is um, every year um, is available for what's called the Critic and Conscience of Society. Uh, sorry, Critic and Conscience of Society Award. And uh, it's representatives from the uh, all the New Zealand universities make a choice. So I was fortunate enough to to get the nod this year, which was very nice. And the Gamma Foundation is run by the Nelsons, who are a very rich philanthropic couple in Christchurch, just so we've got full disclosure. And, and Robert, part of that award was uh, your work in, I think, communicating what is happening in the rest of the world to um, audiences and to the New Zealander in the street. And your conversations with us, very much uh, part of that brief and greatly appreciated. Now, I, I wanted Thank to you. talk to you, first, I, I wanted to talk to you uh, about the stuff happening, well, in our neck of the woods, but uh, when I rang to talk to you yesterday, you said, well, look, Putin's just <laughs> fired his best mate as Minister of Defence. Um, this guy, was it Shigu? Um, looks Shigu. like, yeah. Shigu, they were best buddies, head of the Defence Force, they're at war, what on earth is going on in Russia? Well, I think I think Mr. Putin's had a bit of a uh, reshuffle, as they call it. Um, he hasn't actually been as initial reports suggested he'd been demoted, but he may have even been promoted. He's been moved over to um, being the Minister for National Security uh, or head of the National Security um, Agency, and so it's been, it's certainly a sideways move, and possibly in an upward trajectory, but. It's, uh, yeah, he's bringing in an economic advisor as his defence minister. And uh, this is quite, I think, you know, a reshuffling of the team, an important time for Russia's uh, involvement in its, annex its attempted annexation of Ukraine. Um, there are, for, for the Russians, it's both a picture of hope and alarm. Um, the hope is that they can capitalise on what has been a sh shortfall in American uh, defence assistance for Ukraine, which is now rapidly being made up. Um, but um, the, the Russians possibly see a window of opportunity. It's announced in the last 24 hours that they've captured nine settlements, uh, villages. Um, but there is real concern. And the concern is that the casualties remain very high on the Russian side, but also that the Ukrainians are now going to get weaponry that was previously denied them. Um, uh, particularly um, what's called the Army Tactical um, Missile Systems, which the Ukrainians have been asking for for a long time. These are missiles which have a range of more than 300 kilometres and certainly can reach Crimea and can certainly reach most of the Russian-occupied part of Ukraine. And, so, and also those long-awaited F-16s are arriving soon. So... There's, a, there's also some, this, you know, Mr. Putin may have thought this is just the time he wanted to reshape his team. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it remains to be seen how the new arrangement works out. Mm. Um, of course, he never says he's going to back down. Is there a hope or is there a growing hope for a negotiated peace and ceasefire, Robert? Personally, I don't think so. I, you know, I disagree with a lot of my colleagues who believe um, that this war is unwinnable for Ukraine. Um, if you look at previous wars where lesser powers have got engaged with great powers, 
they often take a long time before the great power realizes that the costs of continuing are too great. For Ukraine, they've got nowhere else to go. And Russia does have the option of withdrawing its forces to go back to the internationally recognized borders of Russia. So it does have that option available. I don't think Mr. Putin's got any intention of doing that. And the reason I don't think there's too much wiggle room, Sean, for a diplomatic settlement um, is that uh, there is a concern that if Mr. Putin was to get the land that he's currently occupying in, in, in return for peace, that he might be tempted six months or maybe a year down the track when Russia is stronger again to demand more because the initial invasion was an attempt to annex the whole of Ukraine. It wasn't just part of it. And it's quite clear that many of Ukraine's neighbours, you know, would find a land for peace deal unacceptable because they believe they might be the next target. The other right. thing, uh, the other crucial thing here from a New Zealand point of view is that you, we can't really have rules which are broken and then the breaking of those rules is codified. That is to say, if, if Mr. Putin got away with basically a land grab, and then had it ratified through a treaty, that would set a very bad precedent, and it'd be bad news well, the rule for smaller of international and middle power. Yeah, for international law, absolutely. Yeah, yeah precisely. Be a horrible it, it would it, it would encode the principle that might is right, which is precisely not the sort of world most New Zealanders want to live in. All right. Now, look, I know when we spoke yesterday, I said let's not get into Israel, but I do have a question for you. The United Nations has just what officially recognised the state of Israel, correct? You mean the Palestinian state? Oh, Palestinian, or? sorry, the Palestinian state. Yeah, um, my bad. So the United Nations has officially well, recognised the Palestinian state, right? Uh, well, my understanding is 143 countries, including our own, voted uh, for the status of Palestine to be elevated to that of statehood, yes. Okay, but at the moment, Palestine is ruled by a... Well, uh, an administration that we have defined as a country as a terrorist group, right? And that we now no longer delineate between well, Hamas's think, te- uh, military arm. And, about, yeah, let's be quite clear about this, Sean, because I think there's a, you know, it's easy to get. It's a complex area. Okay, that's why um, I asked you. <laughs> firstly, but well, first of all, Gaza, uh, the West Bank, and um, East Jerusalem were previously outside of Israel's control until the 1967 war. Yeah. And during the 1967 war, it annexed those territories plus the Golan Heights. Under the terms of the settlement, the Resolution 242, Israel was to relinquish, it was envisaged that Israel would relinquish control of those territories which were won through the act of war. And to be fair, Israel fought a defensive war because it responded yeah, to, to what was attack. an anticipated attack. Yeah. yeah. 